Uh, what are we? Episode 98 here of Tech Sales Insights brought to you by Sales Community and Open Symmetry. Uh, Eric, how you doing? Very good, Randy. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Great to have you. Diana, how you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, uh, we got a twosome here, uh, so definitely uh, should be a, a, a great uh, episode. So Eric Brock, who is chairman and CEO of Andas and uh, Andas Holdings, we'll hear about some of the other companies as well. And then Diana Shapiro, who is CEO of Dynam AI, a very, very cool company as well. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to have some uh, I guess affiliations and work with both. Uh, full disclosure, Andas is a public company. I'm on his board. So hopefully we get the uh, SEC check mark there. Uh, our right. title topic is automating manual processes, uh, which is will be very cool. And we're uh, sponsored by Open Symmetry, who is the sales performance and management sponsor of sales community. There's a cool little write up on them, but um, you know, for those, especially in the tech world, and um, I guess a lot of non-tech as well these days, you know, we're trying to figure out what's the right compensation system, how do you have the right metrics, what do you do, how do you do it? Lots of tools out there. Uh, Open Symmetry is uh, fantastic in helping you figure that out. Uh, so by way of background, I first met Diana, uh, I think it was late last year and uh, has been uh, really good to know and uh, definitely admire her uh, background. Really interesting going from a uh, long time CRO into the CEO role, which we'll talk about a little bit. She lives in uh, Southern California around San Diego and uh, interests besides work are uh, golf and uh, her kids and her husband, which uh, I guess get, get, get some time in her busy schedule. Uh, Eric, I've known a little bit longer. We're not sure how long, but probably 20-ish years or so. And um, uh, lo lots of interest, but maybe we'll talk about Boston sports uh, for sure. And uh, he also lives in the Boston area. So if we uh, jump right into it, I always like to start off with uh, kind of your first job. And if you can quickly going through your career, uh, you both actually started kind of on the financial services side, which is interesting. Uh, Diana, you started at Merrill Lynch originally and then uh, got, us, uh, got into tech. So uh, maybe tell us more. Sure. So uh, early on, actually, before that, I'll trick you up a little bit. I was in the oh. health club industry uh, <laughs> while I was going to school in college and, and really uh, sort of moved out to California from Boston for that industry, but uh, quickly uh, realized I needed a real job. And um, I was recruited by Merrill Lynch because of my sales background and sales skills which I can't tell you, uh, being in the health club industry really did help me with that quite a bit. Um, so working for the sports club company, uh, but got into um, stocks and bonds in the financial industry, um, became a financial advisor, um, found myself more obsessed with my Bloomberg terminals than selling stock of the day to little old ladies. And so I, after about a year, um, left and, and got into uh, the analytics side. So I uh, was lucky to join um, the founder of MarketWatch.com and BondEdge and stayed with that company for the better part of six years as executive vice president of sales. Um, really, uh, had, that was my foray into um, a really more advanced analytics, looking at duration of portfolios and how prepayment models worked as interest rate curves shifted. Uh, to, to help uh, the buy side manage their portfolios. Um, from there, um, I thought I was going to retire and, and have kids, um, which lasted a couple of weeks, um, and then instead decided to start my own company, uh, Corporate Cost Solutions, which I still own today. It's been over 20 years, um, helping companies divert waste from landfills. Um, and I was a, an affiliate of a, a company called Environmental Waste Solutions. And we saved millions and millions of dollars with these algorithms for determining how full your, your waste containers are before they get taken away. Um, and rode that uh, for about 14 years as the COO of that company. Um, thought I was gonna retire again. And that lasted a little longer, about a month, um, and got into the medical device side. Um, these are all just introductions and relationships. Um, I've only put my resume together once in my entire life. Um, and uh, looking at brainwave technologies and how uh, we could potentially use EEG technology to diagnose patients and then also come up with treatment plans in the mental health industry. So doing some really great things for veterans. I'm still an owner in that company. 
um, and that is going through clinical trials right now with Special Operations Command. So super exciting stuff. Um, COVID uh, kind of had me take a step back from active management at that company. Um, and I used the opportunity to go back to school at MIT and take some classes in artificial intelligence and machine learning, because I realized as a C-level executive, I didn't understand. It didn't make sense to me. It was all the buzz um, all over Wall Street. You see these companies going public um, and, and raising huge amounts of money, but I didn't understand it and knew we needed it, knew other CEOs were like me with deer and headlights. So I learned about it, got my certificate, um, and about a couple of weeks later, um, got that call from Dynam AI that they were looking for a CRO. And so I joined the company as chief revenue officer um, about a year and a half ago, maybe a little less, uh, to really help them take their frontier technology to market and help them with their messaging, positioning, uh, branding, all of that. Um, and I did that for about three months before I got that tap again. Um, and they brought me up into the role of CEO. And so that's that's sort of my career path as of now. Um, so I'm the CEO of Dynam AI. Awesome, great. And we'll be uh, diving into that a little bit more. And uh, Eric, you were uh, also the financial services side a little bit longer and then uh, got into the uh, tech side. Yeah, I'd, I'd say, Randy, I'm probably one of the most unlikely technology executives you know, and you, I know you know a lot of them. So, uh, uh, in fact, I agree. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been doing this now for five years, which is amazing. So, I guess I, I, I can say I'm a veteran, but uh, but maybe I'll come back. We'll certainly come back to that. A little bit about me: I, I, I did spend most of my career on Wall Street, uh, but before that, I really started uh, as an accountant. So I studied accounting at Boston College. I came out sort of traditionally, I went to one of the, I think it was the big six, we called them back then. I, I think there's only four or three left. It was uh, Ernst & Young. They had just changed from Ernst Young and Flintstone. Uh, but uh, but anyway, I started as an auditor. It was a great experience. I learned a lot about it, you know, very, all, all these different industries. Um, and by the same time, I always had this itch to go to Wall Street and an interest, and I didn't quite know how to get there. So. Um, I went on a business school. I went to the University of Chicago, and that was the transition. When I got out of Chicago, uh, I worked at uh, Bear Stearns as an investment banker. I did that for a couple of years. Uh, I loved it. Uh, it was really exciting. We worked incredibly hard. Uh, and, you know, it's sort of the New York experience. We can get five years of experience in one. So uh, I spent two years, and, and then I had an opportunity to uh, launch a, uh, an investment company in Boston, uh, a hedge fund. Um, it was a global long short strategy, and that was back in March of 2000 when we launched the firm. It was called a firm called Cloud Capital, C L O U G H. And um, of course, that was right in time for the collapse of the technology bubble. And uh, so the first couple of years, we were swimming upstream pretty uh, into some, some headwinds for sure. But we had our eyes open uh, and we were able to preserve capital for customers. Then we were able to grow in the next up cycle, which was significant. Uh, then 08, 09, we preserved capital again and then we grew. And um, so it was a great experience. But I always had this itch to to move to what I um, call the principal side of the table. And in and around 2017, it was, it was for a variety of reasons, it was a good time uh, for me to make a career change. Uh, and I made a handful of investments in some small companies, and Andes was one of them. And I thought I'd stay in the more, stay in the financial world, and I and I maybe put a, a, a an investment fund around the the, the concept that uh, small companies are starved for capital when it comes to Wall Street. Back in the '90s, we had this big growth market, and Wall Street would fund these new emerging technology companies. But the market has become so big, it's complicated. They don't get funding's more difficult. Companies stay private longer. So I wanted to fish where people weren't fishing. In you know, long story short, I made the investment. I saw in Andas, I saw some what, what I think is world class technology hitting some really large markets we're going to talk about. And I decided to um, I to, to organize an investor group and they asked me to run it. And um, here we are. Awesome. All right. So, Diana, maybe tell us more about uh, Dynam AI. So Dynam AI is a niche player in artificial intelligence. Um, in, in speaking with Gartner, where so we're a, a customer of Gartner. Um, I realized that we're playing in a space that's up and coming called decision intelligence, where we break down a decision to the lowest common denominator, and then we put algorithms behind it. So we're able to automate the decision making processes for companies. And interestingly, the top uh, business priorities for AI at companies starts with automating business processes 
improving existing products or services, improving competitive differentiation, um, and it just goes down the line, um, generating revenue growth, growing into new markets. So these are all the top things that uh, CEOs are looking to use artificial intelligence for, and it just so happens that's really our focus. We just never really had a, a name um, or a, a sector within AI to um, encompass ourselves with. And so that really is it. And then underlying that, we have a frontier AI technology um, that we are going through the patenting process on now called Context Augmented Machine Learning. And it really takes machine learning to the next level by bringing context into the mix. And context is really first principles, it's behavior, it's um, buying um, propensity, what makes someone buy, and really understanding that decision-making process all along the sales process, the business process, you know, it could be the mining process, mining gems. It doesn't matter what that process is. It's bringing outside context into the machine learning process. So that's really our differentiator. That's our claim to fame. So to imagine there could be use cases across kind of almost every industry or everywhere. Are you trying to kind of segment and focus in any in particular? Yeah. So um, given I have that big sales uh, background, I like the idea of, of, of getting to wherever the money and demand are. Right. So there, the low hanging fruit right now, at least what we're finding, is companies that already have a data science department that are already thinking about artificial intelligence that have a digital transformation strategy in place they already understand the benefits of AI. Yeah. And so we sort of leapfrog over those folks um, that are still in a, a deer in headlights position. We don't want to have to educate uh, too much. Um, and we're so we're focused on helping accelerate those companies that already get it and just want to get to the next level with AI. So business services, those are like the big five consulting companies. Um, uh, anything that's doing business intelligence software it's a huge market area for us. Um, they're looking for ways to increase their um, advancements in the analytics they deliver to their end customers. And they just don't have the internal expertise to be able to do that. We're a team of physicists. Um, and then the next one is manufacturing and software. So manufacturing, think medical device, uh, test and measure equipment, um, mining is a big one. Anything where physics um, could come into play or more advanced and more complex decision making. Um, especially when it comes down to the products that they're building um, or want to deliver. And then thinking about, you know, what are the advanced analytics that customers are asking of companies? So software is a huge one, medical device software, but also medical software, healthcare, digital transformation software is also really big. Um, and then the last one is finance. So um, it was interesting to me, it kind of, um, it threw me for a little bit of a loop when I was looking for companies that already have a data science department and found that finance is number four um, or number three um, underneath manufacturing um, and business services um, and software. And they've been really looking at predictive analytics for a very long time, but they don't have any advanced tools. They're using these Monte Carlo simulations to forecast where the stock market is going to go based on shifts in interest rates or based on different environmental factors or macroeconomic factors. And I'm like chomping at the bit to get in there and bring in our uh, frontier technology to help them, just given what we talked about in the beginning, which is my background um, in finance from, from long, long back. So both that sector and the industrial sector, um, since I used to work in the, both of those, I can see the writing on the wall for you know being able to get in there and help them increase ROI using AI. That's awesome. And we're uh, you mentioned the prep session. We're not allowed to talk about it, but you're also uh, finishing up a uh, funding round as well. Yes, being it's that true. You're still private, correct? Yes, thank you for bringing that up. We're seed seed stage, um, uh, late stage seed company, and we have an open round right now. Yes. Perfect. Uh, and what else here? What about from a kind of culture perspective? So, uh, and I know you're hiring a fair bit, kind of what, what do you, uh, share around the culture? Obviously hard being kind of I'm sure some remote workers and whatnot. For me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we've got a really, um, unique culture. Um, we, it's very inclusive. Um, we have an inclusive environment at Dynam and then, Really what we're finding is that data scientists and machine learning engineers, they want to have a myriad of different projects that they're working on. And so they're less excited about going and working for a company that does you know, the same thing, like making dishwashers 
um, and coming into a company like us where we're solving the bigger problems. Um, so we're really solving all these cold cases that have been up on the shelf that companies have been unable to solve and they just love that challenge. And so we create an environment where it's just exciting to come to work every day. You don't know what project you're gonna be handed. Um, and that's the, the that's top of mind, I think, for my employees, at least when I go on Slack, they're all talking about the new project that just, you know, they just got on their, in their inbox. Awesome, really exciting. And uh, from Ross Taylor, he said, awesome stuff, Ross, thanks so much. So for, uh, I should have mentioned before, anybody watching along, feel free to comment or ask any questions as well. Um, this is, uh, I've got some travel this week, so they're, uh, Diana and Eric were kind enough to change the schedule around, so it's a little bit, uh, off cycle for the uh, timing here. So, uh, Eric, maybe uh, briefly uh, cover uh, Andas Holdings. Certainly, great, great company. You know, lot, lot, lots of big customers. Yeah, yeah. So, Andas Holdings uh, provides uh, what I what I describe as uh, data centric technology platforms to critical industries. So, you think about railroads, oil and gas, utilities, public safety. Um, you know, these businesses, they operate over not just wide areas, but extremely wide field areas, and they need uh, connectivity to run those, their businesses. They need to talk to their people, their assets, their equipment in the field to run operations. And what we do at Ondas um, is we have we have two technology platforms, that, which are uh, two wholly owned si subsidiaries and sister companies. There's Ondas Networks and American Robotics. Ondas Networks provides that private wireless uh, platform. So, for example, Example, the railroads can run the trains faster. Right? They wanted they, these the, the, these critical industries. They want to deploy new technologies in the field. It's it's about data uh, uh, deploying sensors, right? Bring information back from the field um, so they can again use that data to to, to, to run more efficiently, more safely. Uh, they want to adopt edge computing. They want to automate what they do uh, for all the benefits we know. And it's hard because they're, these are the, the, these operations are outside the city or urban environments where infrastructure is. So they have to rely on private networks uh, to do that. So as we were going through this um, uh, you know, process to in introduce our technology platform, starting with the railroads, we started. We did a lot of work and we realized the, you know, the whole ecosystem around what a network um, uh, can enable in the drone is, a, is, is an incredible uh, opportunity. We see these big critical markets. Um, you think about rail, again, oil and gas utilities. They're, they have budgets that are growing, spending on drones, and it's really a data service that they're trying to, to achieve. Uh, so we, we, we've we merged with, uh, about a year and a half, half ago, a company called America Robotics. So again, that's our second um, uh, technology platform. And the, the America Robotics uh, is offering a fully autonomous drone platform. So they're solving problems around the bottlenecks for these 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 um, these drone programs I told you about. You know, they're spending the money. They want to harness the power of the drone, but there's there, there's bottlenecks around pilots. Right, pilots are expensive and cumbersome to manage. And of course, the bigger issue is the FAA. Um, you know, the FAA it, it does not permit wide scale deployment of drones because the technologies haven't been uh, matured enough. However, uh, American Robotics has both an autonomous system, so we've solved that pilot issue, and we've also um, uh, solved the FAA issue because we have unique, clearly best in class approvals to operate our drones with no human on site. So that means we can put it next to the rail yard, we can put it next to a well pumps and storage tanks, a solar farm and that drone can do the monitoring of fields the inspection of assets and systems that provide a lot of valuable information to the to, to, to our, our customers so so again you think about these industrial drone platforms and the sister companies the drone is part of a network and the network is is really what um, an upgrade for, for more data capacity and flexibility we're providing uh to these critical markets and, and that's a logic you know randy you have uh, uh, diana, diana and i here today you know diana has been helpful to to us and dynam ai is in this partnership we have uh, to bring uh, the data analytics element of, of this data solution that, that I'm talking about. Um, and I know we're going to touch on that. Excellent. So we'll jump right into that. So, uh, Dan, our title, title topic is automating manual processes. Uh, it's probably old school description. Newer school would be decision intelligence or automating uh, decision making. Um, so kind of a, at a high level, how do you kind of de define uh, define this? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can give you a little backstory and Eric can cut me off if I'm saying something I shouldn't um, as far as sharing. But when we um, initially formed our strategic partnership, the, the biggest question I had from a sales perspective was what are the biggest challenges? What are 
um, the use cases that you're trying to solve. What are your clients asking of you that you're unable to do currently? What, you know, where can we add value basically, right? Because then we're both going to be successful and that's how you close a sale, right? Is the win-win and figuring yeah. out, you know, where does it fit together? And for automating processes, we, it just kept coming back to the oil and gas industry where um, it was really interesting for me to hear that um, regardless of which company it is, they're sending a guy in a golf cart three times a day to look for loss of containment, which is apparently a huge problem <clears throat> in the oil and gas industry to catch sooner rather than later. <clears throat> and so what we're able to do is take their aerial imagery and we have an exclusive arrangement with American Robotics and actually um, create an advanced level software that can detect oil and detect it as opposed to a shadow as opposed to a garbage bag, which are some similar substrates. And this is not yeah. something that's being solved with traditional machine learn learning currently. So what we've done essentially is given um, American Robotics a differentiator, um, a way for them to come to market for their outside customers, regardless of whether it's in the oil and gas industry or another industry. And we're helping them build um, a software solution where they can actually get more advanced analytics than any of the competition. And so that's that that's what makes us excited. Um, that's what at the basis of our partnership. And so now, um, as we're starting to solve these problems together, um, I think it creates even more of a laundry list behind us, um, not just for American Robotics and Ondas Networks, but for outside companies that are really just looking to differentiate. Yeah. So instead of having people driving around with golf carts, it takes forever and very, very inefficient for a whole bunch of reasons. You can have the drones. You can see kind of where the oil spill is, knowing that it is actually oil and you know, much more timely, much more effective, cost savings, everything else. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, would, I would add to that. It's um, so so the drone can ca capture the data. When we're talking about data, we're talking about typically high resolution images. It might be thermal images. Um, it might be uh, 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 emissions, fugitive emissions. So there's all these different payloads we can put on the drone to collect that specific information, which is valuable. Uh, but what the customer does, you know, we we, we don't want to change from having a, the customer the golf cart with a clipboard saying, okay, check, didn't see it, didn't say, oh, I saw something, uh, to just, you know, then we give them, here's 100 pictures or 1,000 pictures or gigabytes of pictures. Uh, now you can look at pictures, right? Because that's inefficient too. And what the truth is, um, and, and again, the, 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 the sophistication that, that uh, Dynam uh, provides to us to help develop the analytics, the machine learning uh, tools, so we can automate the, 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 uh, the analytics behind those images. So it's not a person, but it's actually the software doing the work is incredibly powerful. Uh, and, and not only is it uh, you know saving time, but the quality of, of, of of what you can learn from these images is much better than you can see from the human eye. So, so it's a you know when we think about end-to-end -end solutions to these complex technologies, I get back you know to the to the premise I said. You, know, you need to bring it all to the customer because if they have to do it themselves, it's incredibly expensive. It's incredibly complex. They have to build that internal expertise, and it's not practical. But if you can do it all, and the part of the partnership we have is it really helps us complete that puzzle. It's a powerful um, uh, it's, it's a powerful solution. Yeah, I'll add to it. So they're not just solving a problem for one customer. They're solving an industry related problem. So when you do that, you're just like levels above, right? Your competition, um, because you're thinking way bigger than just one customer. You're thinking about, you know, what can I do for the industry to help get it to the next level? Um, so we're, we're, I don't want to geek out on you and your, your folks, Randy, but That's right. we're really, <laughs> we're accelerating predictive analytics. Predictive analytics isn't just looking at historical data and telling you what happened. It's using the historical data plus current what's going on in the physical world and trying to predict what's going to happen next. Um, so is there going to be an oil spill rather than there is yeah. an oil spill? So those yeah. are the fun and things we're doing together. Yeah. Yeah. And are you working on use cases relative to kind of the sales and mar uh, sales and marketing environment? We are not with um, not with Ondas and uh, American Robotics, right. but we're approached by uh, the consulting those big consulting yeah. companies where that's uh, second after um, automating uh, uh, supply chain. So supply chain is number one, and then sales processes 
is number two. Um, yeah, we absolutely are. And it's the same thing. So if you can break down the sales process, which I know you have great strategies for into the lowest common denominator of what needs to happen in order to get that sale closed, you can actually automate that process if you're able to compartmentalize and then util you can utilize artificial intelligence and machine learning to set up um, an automated process with your um, uh, CRM. Yeah, very, very, very cool. Yes. And then, uh, so Eric, kind of, you're really helping to bring together a lot of these best of breed technologies to really kind of come up with a, you know, just some fantastic solutions. Right. Yeah, so, um, but it is about sort of understanding what the customer needs and we come in solving that critical bottleneck is can you collect the data? Can you do it efficiently? So i.e. We're, we're, we're removing the pilot and the FAA is giving us permission to do that, which is really difficult, difficult to do. A fully autonomous platform that works every day as a workhorse without human intervention is, is really special. Uh, but the customer is not hiring us just to, to watch something, you know, the drone fly, which is impressive, but it, it's the value, right? They're paying us for the value, and that is the intelligence. So we go in and we say, okay, we're defining this industry. We're defining the solutions. We're doing the hard things. We can collect the data, but then you have to architect what it is. So say, we can do these five things, and the customers say, great, let's get going. But there's 20 or 25 things we want to do next. Can you do that? And of course, then you get on the roadmap with them to do it. And uh, that's all about sort of helping select new payloads. It's helping work, you know, uh, you know, develop these analytics, which is, you know, is, is the hard work. And again, that's what we're working with Dynamon. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. So you guys have been on sales calls together with you, all, you both of you, American Robotics. So that must be pretty cool. It is, and I'll let I'll, I'll let uh, uh, Diana uh, sh share more on that because she's she's more intimately involved than I am. Um, but yeah, it, it's 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 a really great uh, way to show uh, the breadth of the solution, the breadth of our capabilities. When you can bring a best a best of breed partner in to say, okay, we're doing this complex technology, we're integrating it, we're getting on a roadmap to give you more and more um, uh, capabilities, and you know, let's bring the experts in this, you know, to really show you what we're capable of doing today and capable of doing in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the way we come to market really and our, our, our perfect scenario for both an investor and a partner is to have a company like American Robotics or Ondas Networks where they've got this pipeline of customers and they can deal with all of the customers. We just want to deal with Ondas and American Robotics and empower them to close more customers. And so the fun part for us is asking them about their wish list. So what, you know, what do you need to accomplish in order to close more customers? And for them, it's about asking their customers, you know, what are you unable to solve right now with your existing technology or your existing processes? Yeah. And it's just, it's that um, flywheel approach between the two of us. And so uh, we, you know, we, we show up as if we're part of um, Ondas or American Robotics um, when meeting with customers or even just internally meeting, we're an extension of them. So we're looking to be the AI partner to companies out there. I, I would like more of these types of relationships. I think it is absolutely the perfect fit, uh, perfect win-win um, on all sides. Oh, that's great. And then, uh, Diane, I'm probably preaching the choir, but you know, a lot of times I'll deal with you know technical CEOs who you know, maybe can build it, but they don't really get to go to market. So I'd have to imagine coming from a CRO to a CEO, just in terms of really just getting that whole go to market engine must be, you know, it's great for you, but probably even better for uh, you know th those at your company. Yeah, I mean, I you know I told, come from uh, a line of uh, sales jobs, right? And so I know, and I've been told by my CEOs of the past that sales is the lifeblood of any company, and it is the first thing to be concerned about because if you don't, you could have a great product or a great service, but unless you have great people out there identifying those good fits for you, then it really could be a, just a giant paperweight, right? And so. Oh, yeah. Yes, I absolutely wholeheartedly um, look at, you know, where is the demand right now um, and are we building something meaningful? So product market fit is front of mind for me. Um, we always test, you know, any new technologies that we're building um, and there will be many uh, to make sure that the demand is there and that we have uh, the appropriate sales channels in order to get them in front of the right customers. Yes. Oh, that's great. So uh, to change in hats here, Eric, so kind of being a financial markets uh, yeah. e expert of sorts, um, kind of how are you kind of planning and kind of with your company thinking about 
uh, you know, the world, you know, not knowing what's, what's, what's going to be happening here. Well, it is, uh, it, it's an interesting time. Um, if I step back more, more, um, it, it, take a bigger picture view if I can, and I'll, and I'll try to be brief. Um, you know, for a lot of small emerging companies, it's always a bear market, right? Raising capital is incredibly difficult. And of course, uh, when you're doing hard things and you're, and you're building, it requires capital. So, um, you know, the thing I learned with coming from Wall Street to the corporate world is it takes all different skill sets and experiences to be be successful. And I was able to sort of bring that experience that, um, that I do have from the financial markets uh, uh, to a team that had incredible technical talent. We had technology that had been developed. We had end markets and domain expertise, uh, but we needed you know, more to, to, to pull it all together. Uh, and, and that's the role I play. Um, now, you know, episodically, you know, it's never a straight line, right? There's always, and, and of course, you're, you're, you have to deal with outside forces. And today, th those forces are difficult. They're tightening up. Um, I think in this environment, like like everyone, you have to, you know, really spend time prioritizing what you're going to do. You could have a hundred things to do, but you know, you're not going to do them all in the next uh, six months. And you just sort of you have to make these difficult decisions. And um, you know, that's a it's an interesting part of the job. Um, it does uh, have its benefits because focus is is is, is typically going to be better than, than than trying to do the scatter shot. So it's a way of being disciplined. So I think the investors that, that in, in this investment climate. Uh, can make you more disciplined, and I think that's um, you know that that's that's the way we're looking at it. Oh, that's great! And then uh, kind of around the topic of uh, kind of value selling, uh, Diana, how do you th uh, think about that uh, these days? Yeah, it kind of parlays off of what Eric was saying. So um, you know, my background in corporate cost um, reduction really, I've been through two recessions. I think Eric has been through two as well is you really learn how to become flexible and adjust you know where you're selling and what you're selling and recognizing that the companies that you're selling into are looking to cut costs or they're looking to increase revenue they're looking to increase the bottom line and during a recessionary time or a time like we're going through right now the easiest way to increase the bottom line is by cutting costs um, while that's not what salespeople want to hear um, they could certainly position themselves with companies that are looking to help companies reduce costs, um, increase ROI. And the very be best way to accomplish that is with automation and being able to do better things with less people. Um, so that's ROI. And if you can focus on that during a recessionary time or a slow growth time or a time that we're going through right now, then you found your next bull market, right? As Kramer likes to say on Mad Money, <laughs> there's always a bull market somewhere um, and that is it. And so we're lucky, um, grateful actually to be in that place um, with artificial intelligence and also robotics where, you know, if you can automate a manual process, then you can both reduce costs for a customer and help them increase revenue. Absolutely. And then uh, that's great. Thanks. And then, uh, you know, Eric, with Ondas, you certainly have some, you know, large rail customers. We won't, we won't talk about the specific yeah. names, but um, the kind of ROI and value sell that, you know, Ondas, you know, provides is uh, fantastic. It is. And, uh, and what we're providing is is really the backbone um, uh, in, in, in the form of a network uh, that they can adopt new technologies for automation. So, um, and just, you know, so there's, there's some simple math around this. Um, it, the, the class one rails, there's seven of them uh, in North America, including the two Canadians. And they generate something like $90 billion a year in revenue every year. Um, and it's, it's a critical part of the economy. It's a very dependable business. Uh, and they vet, invest. Their capital budgets are massive. They're 15 to 20% of revenues every year. Uh, and they invest for ROI. And it's very, very... Um, uh, 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 the, you know, the, the budgeting process is, is, is very strict on that. Uh, so when you can lay out um, uh, this technology and adopt uh, the, the technologies that feed into the network or need the network uh, around automation, you can run the trains 5% faster. That's about, that's, that's just the math, simple math is four and a half billion dollars a year of, of incremental revenue at a high margin every year. 
So folks like Siemens, Wabtech, um, you know, big vendors, Hitachi, Alstom, they want to drive technologies and they want to drive these upgrade cycles where the, the rail customers can adopt these technologies uh, and they need the network to do that. So, you know, it's an interest, it's, it's a great place to be. And we want to, it gets back to the partnership and these platform technologies and how we do, um, develop ecosystems around what we do. You know, Dynam is a great example of partnering on American Robotics. Siemens is a, is a great example of how we're doing it yeah. um, at Ondas Networks. Awesome. And uh, Diana, maybe talking about uh, sales leaders that you respect um, that you've worked with over the years. So there are uh, kind of one or two in particular. Well, my, my go-to favorite uh, is Anthony Robbins. Um, I have his Unlimited Power book on my shelf back here. I've had it for over 20 years. The pages are yellow and dog-eared, and I still refer to it. And a lot of it is all about um, positioning, right, and making sure that you're not selling a product or service, that you're selling a solution, and that you're understanding what the um, yeah. the person on the other side of the table, what their problems are, and identifying and more of a consultative approach. And so Anthony Robbins is just top of mind for me. I've had, you know, great mentors, um, different CEOs that have taught me things through the years, and I'm happy to share any of those. Failing fast is is the best one I have, I think. Um, it, it goes into every area from hiring to um, clients um, to prospects and knowing when to cut them loose and knowing, um, you know, when you've reached a point where it's not a good fit that, Failing slowly is not a good option ever. So there you, those are my there two you. secrets. <laughs> there, there you go. Uh, my uh, son who was in uh, the one that got drafted, I said, okay, do well fast or fail fast. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I don't know if that's good to say or not. Uh, and there's also a uh, Anthony Robbins, you probably don't know, who's a uh, uh, exec currently at NVIDIA, I believe is where he is. So same name, definitely a good sales leader as well, but thought you might be saying that. Um, all right, so we have a couple of questions here. So again, feel free to comment or ask questions. So from Shannon, I guess I'll put this to Diana, kind of who is your typical buyer? So I guess, you know, what would be the uh, kind of executive decision maker that you're uh, selling to? Yeah, it's a great question. So it's um, the sales cycle for artificial intelligence starts at the top, um, typically. So we had talked about, you know, what are the uh, priorities for businesses with artificial intelligence? A lot of it is about um, automation and cost reduction as a result of automation um, or new products and services, new markets, new revenue streams. And so um, oftentimes it will originate with the C-level executive. It, it may not be the CEO. It may be the COO or the chief innovation officer or uh, the chief scientific officer, someone that has been struggling and trying to implement AI but failed, um, but usually the C-suite. And then after our initial meeting and they understand that we focus on decision intelligence and breaking down the process and understanding the KPIs and it starts to become more technical, which it definitely does when you start talking about how are we gonna implement the solution and what does our interaction need to be like? They'll typically pull in their CTO, um, you know, someone in the data science division if they have one. Um, and if they don't have one, we never get super technical. We just simply do our proposal and then they're going to sign off because they know that we've got the expertise. But it's all about how you contract and developing a, an SOW that really just highlights um, the problem, the solution, the deliverables, um, the strategy, the roadmap and the cost and then getting that signature. Perfect, that's great. And then uh, maybe Eric, to you from uh, Neil, who's at a uh, cool company, Aviso. Uh, so he asked, what's the approach to sell to typically non-tech savvy buyers in oil, gas, transportation, et cetera? So um, kind of you know thoughts or experiences that you have. Yeah, so I would I say as we introduce in platforms, and I'll, and I'll try to be quick here, uh, Ondas Networks and American Robotics are a bit different, but they do have similarities in that um, these are um, our technical um, uh, uh, products, and there's groups inside uh, these large organizations who are charged with um, exploring technologies like ours whether it's a wireless network um, or, or the drone platform and validating it. So, you know, just, uh, you know, the railroads, uh, 
um, there's there's really a centralized process to adopt technologies that will be adopted by the whole industry, and there are wireless experts who do that. Then the trick is once you get um, your, your that validation, and they say, okay, you know, we want to build a network. It's trying to get the buy-in from the folks in the field, and when we do that, it's really going out there and saying, making sure a they know there's there's more bandwidth coming their way. And B, we work with the, 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 the vendors, again, the Siemens, the Wabtex, the Tashis of the world, who, who are going to create value in the network by, by, by putting more bells and whistles on the train systems that are out along the track or at the crossings or on the trains. Um, as it relates to American Robotics, it's similar, though. It, there's um, a lot of these uh, folks who have drone programs, they're, they're, they're getting their feet wet. Um, they're using piloted drones, and they really would want to adopt adopt autonomous technologies and here we are um, you know able to do that so you see those groups who are, who are running the drone pr programs working with innovation teams who are designed and tasked with let's solve this problem let's find a platform that we can scale and so we can adopt the drone technology and run the businesses better so that's kind of the, the, the targets we have oh, great uh, so thanks Shannon thanks Neil so anybody else watching wants to ask questions or comment please feel free uh, so now maybe going over to mentors and advice that you've received. So, uh, Diana, uh, any kind of one or two mentors in particular and any uh, advice that's really stuck with you? Well, I did the fail fast one already. That's my top. That was my top um, mentor. And then with Anthony, Anthony Robbins and, you know, I, I think I've only had three real jobs in my whole life. So there's not that many to go to. But neuro linguistic programming if you know what that is and what, um, what program neuro linguistic programming and nlp okay. so sales sales folks that have read anthony robbins know it well it's so important because as a salesperson or even as a ceo you have to have a really thick skin sometimes right i mean not everyone is pleasant not everyone is easy to talk to and i think you really need to figure out how to flip your brain so that your brain isn't running free. And, you know, you could get depressed sometimes in sales or you could get like nervous. Like, am I doing a good job Is this customer? I can't read this customer. Like, do they like what I'm presenting? Neuro linguistic programming is a method that if you can remember it, it's a picturing snapping a finger, snapping your fingers, not actually doing it, but switching your brain so that you're looking at the positive rather than the negative. Cause it's really easy. Um, to go to the negative side. And it's 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 easier to go to the negative side than to stay on the positive side, especially if the person on the other side is not having a good day. And so you have to remember how to remove the personal, it's business, right? Yep. And I, I think that um, that really has carried through for a good 20, 25 years for me. Oh, that's great. Eric, what about you? Any uh, kind of one or two mentors you've had over the years and uh, advice that has stuck with you? Yeah, I've had a, I've had a lot of mentors uh, in my career, and I'm very fortunate. Um, you know, the things that stand out to me, uh, you know, coming from the financial world versus an investment banker, uh, and then as a fund manager, uh, is integrity. Integrity and 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 really, um, you know, the the fact that your reputation is is, is critical. Um, so it's all always about doing the right thing. I, and if I extend that to what I'm doing here. Uh, it's all about customers, right? You, you know, customers and, and, and investors who are supporting what we do. Um, it's, uh, you know, they have to win before you do is kind of uh, is the mantra that I have. And it's some of the things I've learned along the way. There you go. What about uh, advice uh, you would give your younger self, uh, Diana? Oh, I was recently interviewed by someone that was speaking to an all woman um, audience and my entire career has been spent not looking at things that way. And so I think, um, you know, today with diversity and inclusion and talking about, you know, um, making sure you have a woman on the board and you have, you know, a fully inclusive board and, and all of that, it's great. But I think it almost draws too much attention to that fact that you're a minority. And um, I would remind my, my younger self, um, that the way that I went about things, not looking at that and um, really thinking about more, how, what, what am I bringing to the table? What's the performance that I'm driving um, rather than 
the color of my skin or I'm a man or a woman. And I guess it's not advice to my my former self, Randy. I didn't answer your question. This is more advice Sorry. to your to your yeah. group, your folks. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think that was really um it was impactful for me and powerful. And I almost am um annoyed. Can I say that on, on air live? I'm anno- a little bit annoyed that um there's so much focus on, you know, that minorities should uh, take a bit, have a, a bigger place. I think it's it's really on us to 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 prove ourselves and the same at the same level as everybody else. But just perform, just do your job, work hard, um, show that you're worthy, and and working for good people um, and and knowing who you're working with and for is really important. Um, so that that comes to mind first mm-hmm. for me. Definitely. All right. Thank you, uh, Eric. So for me, uh, I, I guess I'll answer it a little bit differently, kind of sort of like Diana did. Um, you know, the thing I've learned, and, and I want to share it with because because I do talk to a lot of young people, and Randy, I know you do, and this platform is terrific for people really at all stages of their career. But I think um, you know, for young and, and people who are just getting going and, and scaling themselves, is the world is incredibly competitive. It's incredibly competitive in and you know you really need to focus on building skills right skills are personal skills or technical skills around business um and you know i get worried a bit in this and maybe this is just episodic and and part of covid and where we're at and coming out of it um but you know some of the younger people have have had experiences that none of us had early in our careers and and nobody ever has and probably ever will where you know you're not working you know there's just so much dynamic change right and I would say there's, there's, you know, don't take for granted being present and, and engaged, right? You might be able to do your job today, uh, you know, in a venue like this. Um, but if you, if you think, if you extrapolate that over weeks and months and years, you get, you're missing out on experiences that are incredibly valuable. Um, and that worries me. So, you know, I get back to it. It's, you know, it, it is a competitive world. And if you don't understand that, you're in big trouble. I yeah. concur. Yeah. It's also too interesting. The, uh, I have to always watch what we say, but the, you know, kind of the younger generation. And uh, I was exchanging some notes this weekend with a top VC and a CEO at a, a tech company. And um, one of the, the, I'll say the sales management and the rep from the company, you know, we had some things going on. And, you know, I'd sent some, you know, notes on Friday. And this is like Sunday afternoon and they needed to respond. And, you know, they basically say, oh, you know, sorry, it's the weekend. I'm like, well, that's BS. It's not, you know what I mean? It's like, but you have to, you know, anyway. Yeah, somebody else is going to do it if it's, you know. Yeah, if it's, if it's competitive it's, out there. Your yeah. launch is not free. <laughs> it <laughs> is, yeah, totally. So uh, anyway, so time flies when you're having fun. Uh, you've both been great. Diana, thank you so much. And Eric, thank you so much. And uh, Tucker, behind the scenes, as always, uh, appreciate you. Um, so next uh, week, we have Annalise Hussman, uh, who's a sales leader at Gong for episode 99. And then uh, after that, very excited to have Carl Eschenbach, who's a longtime tech exec and uh, has totally crushed it at uh, Sequoia uh, coming up for episode number 100. So uh, for those that are members of Sales Community, thanks. For those that are not, you can go to salescommunity.com and uh, there's a um, tab on there it says uh, fall free so you can use that that one and get a free year membership or you can do the other one and, and pay for it so it's, it's your call and uh, thank you so much to open symmetry the uh, sales performance management uh, framework company and um, we'll go from there this gets posted everywhere so uh, if you want to share it with friends uh, feel free so uh, for those on the east coast uh, have a great night in uh, West Coast. Uh, you still got a couple hours left, I guess. So, uh, Dan and Eric, thanks so much. Thanks, thanks for Randy. having me. It was, it was great. Awesome.